Welcome to Live from HCIC 2023, a podcast series bringing you front row insights from the industry's brightest minds. In this 12-part series, we delve into the heart of the trends impacting health systems with leading experts, senior executives, and thought leaders, as recorded live at the Healthcare Internet Conference in November of 2023. This series is brought to you by Greystone, Bowstring Media, and Touchpoint Media. Listen in as we hear from our industry leaders on the latest innovative strategies and efforts that are shaping our space. Okay, I'm here with Dean Browell. We're here recording live, live CIC, That's right. in sort of a loud conference area, conference space, <laughs> expo hall, right, so to speak. But you hear noises in the background, don't even worry about that. Um, but Dean, thanks for being here today. No, it's a thrill to, thrill to be part. Yeah, this is going to be great. And, you know, I had the pleasure of actually attending one of your sessions earlier today, and I want to get into it in today's topic. But before we do, you know, there are people that may be watching us over here or listening in that don't know who you are, which is a shame. They need to know who you are. Share with them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the chief behavioral officer of Feedback, which I know how made up that sounds. Uh, <laughs> but no, it, I'm one of the founders of the company. We've been around about 15, 14 years, and uh, we've been at this the idea of bringing behavioral science to social list, you know, so it's not just, you know, an API to Twitter and, and looking at how many times your brand is mentioned, but literally getting deep into how does a workforce talk about what it's like to work there and, you know, mm-hmm. getting into condition specific message boards, really getting into patient experience and just really taking it an anthropological look. At yeah. Social list thing. And so, yeah, we've been at this for 14, 15 years. And the good news is that we have all these tools now where we can hear everybody and every, you know, private message that they have online, right? No, that's right. We're talking about the public. Uh, yeah, really, uh, yeah so of course. I yeah. mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the trick, though, too, is it, it really is that, like, uh, it, it is this idea that it, people's experiences are are being shared and they're influencing other people's choices. Mm-hmm. I think we should, we've got to be honest about that. Now, that plays into what we yeah, which is uh, your brand and developing a unique value proposition around who you are as an as an organization. You know, I remember when I started in this space, you know, 15 plus years ago, right, that we had very little of that going on. At that point in time, it was just when reviews were starting to come online. Right. And, you know, heaven forbid we talk about that there's online reviews and things like this. But, yeah. um, you know, at the time, um, a colleague of mine used to call it that everybody's brand was a zombie brand because you didn't know what people were saying about you. Right. 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 Unless you did focus groups. Yeah. Which in and of itself is a kind of a construct, like a Schrodinger's cat construct. Well, that's right. You, you, you've already yeah, you tainted could, it by asking. Exactly. Yeah. You've already yeah. tainted it by asking. So tell us a little bit about, like, how does this concept of, you know, uh, uh, social listening and the work that you do, how does this kind of feed into this concept around developing a better brand and a better value proposition. Yeah, I think, you know, first, firstly, I would just say that, you know, value propositions in general, and this is, I don't think healthcare is unique in this, but I think we're especially guilty of it, which is navel gazing. Mm-hmm. You know, we create them in a vacuum. We, we, we talk all about what we think we're delivering. Yeah. And part of what we really try to set up in both the talk today, and I think where social listening can fit in is to take a step back and just say, Actually, our unique value proposition is the lived experience of the people we serve. Mm-hmm. You know, those those patients, those caregivers. Well, if that's let, let's let's take that and say it may not line up mm-hmm. with the value proposition that you would create in a vacuum for yourself. Right. And so, part of it is to take a moment and say, "Look, this lived experience is noble. They're out there talking. They're informing other people with that." And so, being taking a little more critical look at, look, what what is actually out there? How do people talk about you can help you understand what is not connected, mm-hmm. you know, with your value proposition. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other element to that is most of the unique value propositions are not unique, contain much value. <laughs> and, and aren't are, a proposition. And are really a proposition. Yeah. Just amongst yourself. Oh, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, the, that uniqueness part is, is really killer. I mean, yeah. You know, that's, you, you look at your PR boilerplate, what says in your about page, all of those right. things. And it, you, you just, you know, as we did in the talk today, we do bingo with the buzzwords, you know, compassionate care, high touch, you know, all of them. And yeah, I just think there's, it, there's, there's what you might say in a vacuum. And then there's what's actually that experience is. And I think that facing that, facing what's actually knowable, I think is the first step, right? To really understanding, are you delivering? Right. And, and admitting it and, and facing it. But wait, are you saying we're not all world-class care close to home? <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the trick. 
even if you are, that means there is no difference. There's nothing unique about you to the person down the street. It doesn't matter how many banners about U.S. News you have hanging on the front. Right. Uh, no one's driving by that and going, oh, three banners. Let's go to this one, honey. My right. broken leg. Right. Okay, so well, let's get into then how do you start to understand the unique value proposition yeah. and this concept, right, of this the, the living aspect of your brand. Talk, talk a little bit. About yeah, absolutely. Well, I think first off, it... it and Lila um, Wagner made a great point today in, in the talk about you got to focus on who first. So who are we talking about? Is it is let you know? Are we talking about the patients? So let's say we're focusing on it from a patient perspective. Mm-hmm. It is then understanding maybe it's a service line, maybe it's a facility, maybe it's your whole brand. You know, because brand could mean different things. And just honestly saying, okay, how do people when they talk about their experiences? And I'll even say, I don't want to discount reviews, but let's put reviews off to the side. Let's just say when they discuss with each other, you know, when they're just talking casually, when they're on their sports forum or their, let's say their local soccer club, and they're talking about their bad knee from college, and they they should probably go finally get this thing taken care of, and they ask their friends, hey, where did you go? That's, That's where that start of that conversation. How do people talk about your brand and that action? And so I think starting there first finding out what is that honest, the, the sort of honest elements there. I think it allows you then to, to really scrutinize, okay, to that kind of stakeholder, let's say ortho, right? Mm-hmm. Stay with that example. To that ortho stakeholder, what is it, you know, what do you say about the brand? How do people think about your brand? What do you actually do to act on that? And then does it land, you know? And just really being really honest with that, with, with what you're listening and then what you're actually doing and what matches up. We, we would eventually take this in the, in the talk today into digital, right? Into saying, how does your website reflect those kinds of things? Right. But you could do it with everything. You do it with workforce. Mm. You know, one example we gave today is, you know, DEI. Right. You can have a fantastic DEI statement that everyone's very proud of, the 7 million man hours it took, you know, or people hours it took to create it. But if all of your reviews on Glassdoor are from a single demographic, yeah. What does that say to the new recruit who wants to know what's it like really? What's the culture really like to work there? Mm-hmm. And so if you're looking at your you know, unique value proposition from a workforce perspective and you don't understand how it's actually being communicated, not, not the things you're paying for, not your ad right. buys, but how it's actually being communicated to that new recruit, uh, it, you really, you, you, you are going to miss a gap that is deadly to your actual ability to for your ROI and for your numbers that you're trying to hit with recruitment. So let's go back to what you said, this kind of framework of yeah. think, feel, say, and do. Yep. Right? Because I really like that. You actually had a nice visual yeah. that you shared today. And I, I I took that with me and I'm like, this is an interesting thing because you can apply it so many different ways. Right. Let's let's break that down a little bit. Right? Sure. So I, I know I get the thinking part. We do a lot of that in boardrooms. Right. 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 That's right. This is overthinking a, half the time. Overthinking, yeah. right? And that's where we get sort of those generic statements that are not really unique or what have you. Right. Right. But but go on a little bit further here. What's a what's a better way to kind of frame that thinking part of your brand? Yeah, I think part of it is is also I think admitting that what is that internal operations that's making the things happen that make you unique. Mm-hmm. Right. I think very often on the thinking side, we also get really hung up on things like, you know, and it's, but this is true also, I came from higher ed, you know, accreditation. You know, what are the check boxes? Right. And we kind of assume that's like the table stakes. Mm. Well, that's true. That's also the table stakes that the average consumer assumes you already covered. Right. Like that, that shouldn't be what makes you unique. That's terrifying if that makes you unique, right. basically. So I think with the thinking part, the better way to, to do it would be like, how are you operationalizing you know, the, and, and wanting to always improve upon and move closer to your ideal. Mm-hmm. What, what is happening internally to do that? You know, and then yeah. the do to separate that, the do would be, what do you actually do about it? Right. But the idea that you're actually thinking about it, you're always moving towards that. I right. think that's a. So that's kind of be framed into your, maybe your strategic plan where you're going to be going. That's where your key areas are. Maybe you have a key service line or a specialty hospital. These are some thinking things that can kind of contribute to this. Absolute plan. Right. But then the do part is different, right? It's it has to be. It has to be. And I think there's people that are great at the thinking and they're not great at the doing. And I think you can have the reverse. Right. Right. Where we're great at, you know, putting things into practice, maybe, but maybe it's we put too much into practice. Mm-hmm. You know, and we don't it, it doesn't feel organized. It doesn't feel like it's uh it's cohesive. It maybe, mm-hmm. you know, one hospital is doing one thing, but 
you know, we, we say we have online scheduling, but it's only true for 70% of our service. Right. You know, things like that. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, I know that what that is, you know, or yeah, you know, we have online appointment scheduling, but because of our process, we have to ask these 17 gazillion questions. Right. And we have to call them back anyway, so we really don't have it. That's right. The do is not actually meeting the thing. That's right. Exactly. Right? Well, it, yes, exactly. And you, the idea of like, oh, well, you know, our mothership hospital has this, but the three rural hospitals, it's a completely different experience. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So then you have these other two things. Yep. The feel and right. the say. Right. Let's talk, which one do you want to talk about first? Feel? I'd say, let's say feel. Let's yeah. talk about feel. Tell me yeah. about more about that. So I think that's, it, it, this is a, this is a good example, I think of, and we can get, we can get rightly accused of this, which is that a lot of our operations can come across as incredibly cold mm-hmm. if we're not careful, right? Mm-hmm. No matter how much, po- how positive that change is supposed to be that we're putting into the operational, the idea that, well, but in practice, it ends up feeling incredibly, maybe it's clinical. But, you know, I think a good example of that is, you know, plain language on a web, on a website, mm-hmm. you know, this idea that, oh, yeah, yes, we're covering all the bases of what we're giving out here, but it is, it's coming across really cold and not actually making that patient feel like you're caring about them. Or for that matter, again, you're proving that value proposition. Mm-hmm. It's the same reason why you may have a beautiful website that has all these, uh, all this ability to feature all this different content. And so everybody asks to be on the front page and you let them. Yeah. And so you've inadvertently created a feeling from something that operationally is meant to, to be, to be helpful. Right. But you've created a, a completely, complete disconnect from a feeling perspective. And I think a lot of times too, the feeling aspect c- can happen in small ways. It doesn't have to be these big, That's big right. significant things. Right. Uh, let's get back to online appointment schedules is a great yeah, example yeah. of that. Right. Um, you could, you could have this where. You have, you have, maybe you do online appointment scheduling well, right. you make it easy. You have the operational to do that. That's your thinking. Right. But uh, when people go through and they make an appointment and they hit submit to make the appointment, they don't even get an acknowledgement. That's right. Right. Exactly. That's the missing of the feeling. You're not connecting that back. That's right. That's that right. Is that- a, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. Or an example I gave today, actually, you know, I, I, my dad is recovering from a stroke, but what's. What was so amusing this morning is I was in the hotel room here at, at, at HCIC on, uh, you know, a video of my, of my phone, a FaceTime call with my parents and try to help them use my chart. Mm-hmm. What's really amusing is they have not been to the website of that hospital in a month. Yeah. Because all their interactions r- are all through my chart, mm-hmm. well, which is not intuitive. And so their right. feeling is incredibly frustrated. Yeah. And all the work that's probably put into making their regular website mm-hmm. feel good, maybe it's perfect. Mm-hmm. They'll never know because all their interactions are through this kind of abysmal, you know, gatekeeping yeah. that they're dealing with. Yeah. But. Oh, yeah. When you bring Epic into the feeling part, it's <laughs> right. challenging any patient portal. But to your point, though, here's the thing. And you may feel like, oh, well, we can't change that. Like, yeah. that's, we're kind of captured by that. The change would be in the education potentially with the patient. Right. You know, just a slight bit of hand holding. Or I think one of the examples today was, you know, a great splash page before you get thrown down the well of my chart to give, you know, your your organizational philosophy of using it, maybe some tips on how to use it, how to log in easier or whatever the case may be. But I think like it's it could be a little bit of hand holding could go a long way yeah. to differentiate yourself from any other hospital using my chart. Right. You know, what that feeling feels like. I think about that too in like the candidate applying for a job online, right? Right. Before you right. go into that thing where you search for the right job that you're going to apply for and search that right. for your resume, give them a little bit at the beginning to say, this is who we are. This is what That's we do right. before they actually start searching for the job. So it's not so mechanical. Yeah. Right. I mean, we talk about clinical being cold and things like that, but just the mechanics of it, it you can get so bare bones trying to give um, uh, features to someone that you've inadvertently just sucked all of the life out of and the warmth out of, you know, this sort of mechanical and operational, you know, excess that, that ends up being it. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we got the thinking, we right. got the feeling, yep. we got the doing, yep. the saying. Well, so I think this, this can really go a couple of different ways, but I think the main part of saying is literally your voice, you know, how are you talking about what you're doing? Right. You could look again, you talk about accreditation. I mean, all you're doing is putting the idea in my head that there's a hospital out there where that's not accredited. That's right. Like all you're doing is making me. Or question. maybe one doctor in my in my network. That's right. That's right. Who's way? I, mean, I get yeah, inject, I have to check the stickers on the door. Exactly. Like, is that what I should be doing? 
Um, you know, so I think that's part of it is like, how, how does that voice actually, what, you know, how you, how do you talk about what you're doing? Because you could fall down there. You could be doing them all the right things, but nobody knows that you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, one example we, we gave earlier, I thought was kind of interesting. We've seen it in our clients where, uh, is this organization who was looking to a uh, children's hospital, looking to expand it to a new state. Okay. Well, on that border of that state, the real need there is emergent care. Mm-hmm. Right. What we found were people talking about, this is a good example of that knowable, you know, value proposition. All the people in that state thought, oh, this children's hospital is incredible. We think it must be amazing if you have complex issues. But if I break my foot, all you show me is pictures of kids with cancer. And all you, all you show us is testimonies of these incredibly complex issues. We don't even think about you for the everyday stuff. And it's, it's part of that, like, oh, what we're saying is actually not even allowing us to mm-hmm. to grow in that in that particular region or to you know provide we've inadvertently talked ourselves out of their consideration right. for a great reason right you know a reason that everyone agrees is very positive but you've inadvertently talked yourself out of the consideration set yeah that's great okay so now you so this is a great framework to use right yeah. when you start to consider how do you develop your unique value proposition yeah so once you figure all that stuff out it's easy right it's absolutely that's right it's you've like, done you're done you get a power put a bag that's yeah, right. no, what happens? That's what you, you just wait for the bo- the pay bonus, right? That's you know, right. Just exactly. rolling over <laughs> you after you. No, really. But in reality, what happens then? I mean, because I so that's just a lot of work that gets us, gets us to there. That's right. That you have to do after that. I think the so first off, I would say in that process is getting buy in from other people to help you to help you answer these questions. You know, the, those those are hard to reach. You know, if you're talking about a service line, get the docs involved in in this. Yeah. So they can see the parts too. So I th- so once you've got that buy-in, that will allow you to actually start implementing it with much more, you know, vigor and and real success. So I think it, again, if you're talking about like a digital mm-hmm. element, it may be okay. Let's take this and say what what is what we're doing digitally? How does that line up to any of this? Mm-hmm. You know, what should we change? What friction points should we try and pull out? Um, and it also may mean okay, you know what? We ought to be doing this for this other audience. Mm-hmm. And I think that's especially true on internal mm-hmm. because you know, I mean. It, even I, I made the joke today and it was the, the uneasy laughter in the room around how many of you since the pandemic have been just given internal comms. Yeah. You know, and the problem is you're just given it as a set of things to do. Right. Not to stop and think about, you know, how does it fit within everything else? And right. I think that's doing an exercise like this. There's the things you can change and do and differently, but then it's also, okay, what other audiences would this really help us understand what our gaps are? Right. And I think that's it. You know, try to reapply it in different ways. I think it can give you a real leg up. I think that's the thing. I, one thing I took away from today's conversation is that, right, is that this can be applied in multiple different ways. Right. 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 You could take it to look at a website project. Right. You could take right. it to look at an uh, internal comm strategy. That's right. You can yeah. take it to like how you're looking at your recruitment approaches. Right. right. You can use this uh, this model or framework yeah. Yeah. in multiple different ways to really advance right. yourself in a unique way. Well, and this, and I think the dirty little secret that you could also do mm-hmm. is do it for your competitors. Like sit down with the same stakeholders that you're working with internally and go, okay, we're going to do Y hospital up the street, X hospital 20 miles away, whatever, and do it for them. What do they think, say, do... And then how do we match it up? Where are those gaps? Right. You know, do the, what's there, do the study on their knowable value proposition and do that listening and, you know, map it out. That that might show you, hey, which, which of us is doing something unique and which isn't? Where are we vulnerable? Where are they vulnerable? Right. I mean, that's, that's intel that's organized in a way that I think we are not normally, you know, we're, we're getting the, the fire hose of data sometimes mm-hmm. on that. And, but I think this organizes it in a way that really helps you make better decisions. That's a great example of how to do that, right? I mean, I, we've all done competitive positioning, but right. like right. making this framework to apply it to that yeah. takes it to a whole nother level. I mean, the whole question is, you, you know, we keep saying it's unique value proposition, right? right? Well, the first problem is most of the things you're saying aren't actually unique. Yeah. But the other thing is now compared to the competitor, you may find they're in that same trap. That gives you the pathway Right. How to do an end run around on that. Right, exactly. You can find where those gaps are. Right. Where those opportunities are. Really Absolutely. To right. help serve your community. Yep. Dean, this is great, great stuff. Um, I mean, this stuff, I could talk about this all the time. I'm yeah. a digital guy and I love to talk about this. Yeah. Because I think it's <laughs> fascinating though. Um, but I think it really kind of supercharges the market research that you could do. It supercharges a lot of aspects of what you are. Absolutely. Thanks for spending some time with us. No, it's awesome. Always great, great to talk to you. You're awesome, man. Thanks, bud. 
Thank you for watching live from HCIC 2023. We hope these insights have sparked new ideas and conversations. A special thanks to the industry experts featured on our show and to Greystone, Bowstring Media, and Touchpoint Media for making these discussions available. For more episodes and exclusive content, please visit greystone.net, touchpoint.health, or subscribe through your favorite podcast listening platform. If you want to be part of more conversations like this one, please make sure to attend the Healthcare Internet Conference in Austin, Texas. You can find more details at hcic.net.